We are live. Good morning, everybody. This meeting will now come to order. Welcome to this virtual meeting of the Durham Historic Preservation Commission on this first day of March, 2022. My name is Matt Bouchard and I am chairman of the commission. This commission is a quasi-judicial board of record and as such, all testimony will be recorded. Under this procedure, our meeting today will also be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel. The proceedings of this board are governed by the zoning laws as recorded. As such, please note the steps we have taken to ensure that each party's due process rights are protected as we proceed in this remote platform. First, today's meeting will be conducted in accordance with North Carolina General Statutes Chapter 166A, Section 19.24 which allows for remote meetings and quasi-judicial hearings during declarations of emergency. Second, each applicant on today's agenda was notified before being placed on the agenda that this meeting would be conducted using a remote electronic platform. Every applicant on today's agenda has consented to the board conducting the evidentiary hearing on their request using this remote platform. We will also confirm today at the start of each evidentiary hearing that the participants in the hearing consent to the matter proceeding in this remote platform. If there's any objection to a matter proceeding in this remote platform, that case will be continued. Third, notice of this meeting was provided to the applicants and to the public in multiple ways, including signage posted on site, notification letters mailed to all adjacent property owners informing recipients regarding the remote platform, and a general announcement via our website, informing the public of same. The notices for today's meeting advise the public on how to access the remote meeting as the meeting occurs. Individuals wishing to participate in today's evidentiary hearings were required to register prior to the meeting. Information about this registration requirement, along with information about how to sign up to participate, was included in the mailed notice letters sent to each adjacent property owner. This information was also included on the board's website. The public was advised to contact the city immediately in case of objection to the evidentiary hearing or to the remote meeting platform. Two cases are anticipated to proceed today in which the city has been contacted by an individual with an objection to the case or to the matter being heard in this remote meeting platform. All individuals participating in today's evidentiary hearings were also required to submit a copy of any presentation document, exhibit, or other material they wish to submit at the evidentiary hearing prior to today's meeting. All materials that the city received from the participants in today's cases, as well as a copy of city staff's presentations and documents were posted online prior to this meeting. The agenda and all materials to be discussed today may be viewed at any time during today's meeting by visiting the web link for today's agenda via Durham's Agenda Center. Finally, all individuals who register to participate in an evidentiary hearing on today's agenda, as well as all city staff participants, were emailed a witness oath and consent to a remote hearing form prior to today's meeting. Any individual planning to testify or submit evidence in an evidentiary hearing was notified that they must sign the oath form prior to today's meeting. We will also reaffirm everyone's oath on the record at today's meeting. Are there any members of this board that would have any conflicts of interest with regard to the cases before us today? Hearing none and seeing no raised hands, are there any board members requesting an early dismissal today? I gotta go at 11. But... Thank you, Commissioner Fieselman. Know that. As chair of the Historic Preservation Commission, I'd like to remind everyone that our quasi-judicial hearings function similar to a court proceeding. Staff will first present an overview of the case, and then the applicant will have an opportunity to present their evidence. Opponents, if there are any, and we have been informed that there will be opponents for our two cases today, may then present their evidence and the applicant may then present a rebuttal. Board members will refrain from questions or comments until each speaker has completed his or her presentation. Testimony should consist of facts each witness knows directly, not hearsay. Evidence already presented need not be repeated. 
All witnesses who have signed up in advance will be given the opportunity to speak and their, excuse me, and their testimony will be recorded. <clears throat> the board will vote on each case after the presentation of all evidence pro and con concerning that case. All decisions of this board are subject to appeal to the Board of Adjustment and then to the Durham County Superior Court. Clerk Holmes, please take the attendance of the commissioners who are here today. All right. Chair Bouchard. Present. Commissioner Dayan. Present. Commissioner DeBerry. Here. Commissioner Fieselman. Here. Vice Chair Goolsby. Here. Commissioner Hamilton. Commissioner Calhoun. Here. Clerk Holmes, I did not hear you read the names for Commissioners Johnson or Kreger. Yes, so Commissioner Johnson sent an email this morning and due to a scheduling conflict, she said she will not be able to attend the meeting today. Okay. And then Kreger. I was sure. actually, Carla Rosenberg, I was actually going to announce um, some news regarding uh, Mr. Kreger. So um, he, yeah, when we get to that item, I'll let you know, but he won't be attending today. Okay. And with apologies, I didn't hear um, if Katie uh, was here or not. And I'm I, yeah, so looks like today we have six because okay. Commissioner Hamilton, she didn't say present. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner, you have been forwarded an agenda to today's meeting um, and specifically I'll reference the version of the agenda that Carla Rosenberg sent us all via email on Wednesday, uh, February the 23rd at about 1040 in the morning. Um, it is slightly adjusted from the initial uh, agenda that had been sent to us previously. Um, would anyone like to recommend uh, any adjustments to the agenda, including city staff? Carla, I think you're still on mute. My toolbar bar disappeared, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, I apologize for that. So I do have some adjustments uh, to the agenda. Okay. Um, one, the protocol for work without a COA, um, we need to do a little bit more research on that. So I'd like to shelf that um, for another month, um, possibly next month. That is the new business item D? Correct. Okay. And I would like to um, make an announcement uh, prior to the approval of minutes. Do that as the next item. Okay. Great. And that's it. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, along with the agenda that Carla sent us on uh, the 23rd, um, and actually as, as linked to that agenda, uh, you've been provided with draft minutes for our last two commission meetings, um, January the 11th and February the 1st. Uh, let's start with the January 11, 2022 draft minutes. Uh, does anyone have any adjustments to the draft minutes that they would like to recommend? Quick question, Matt. Carla, did you say you wanted to make an announcement before we approve minutes? You know, it honestly, it doesn't. We could do the minutes first. Let's just continue the minutes and then um, I will make the announcement after the minutes. My apologies, Carla. I wrote it down underneath the minutes <laughs> instead of before. <laughs> we'll do it right after the minutes. Again, commissioners, any suggested revisions uh, to the January 11, 2022 minutes? Seeing no hands raised, hearing from none of my fellow commissioners, 
May I have a motion, please, to approve the January 11, 2022 minutes? <clears throat> motion to approve the January minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Fieselman. Can I have a second, please? Second, Andy Goolsby. Second. Thank you, Vice Chair Goolsby. Thank you, Commissioner Calhoun. Uh, Clerk Holmes, roll call vote, please. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Dan. Ooh. Commissioner DeBerry. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Approved. Vice Chair Goolsby. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you, Clerk Holmes. Moving on to our February 1, 2022 draft minutes. Do any of the commissioners have any suggested revisions to that set of minutes? Okay, seeing no hands raised, hearing no objections to the minutes. Can I please have a motion to approve the February 1, 2022 minutes? Motion to approve the February minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Fiesman. Second, please. I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Dayon. Clerk Holmes. Right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Dayon. Approved. Commissioner DeBerry. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Approved. Vice Chair Goolsby. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Okay. Motion passes six to zero. I just want to um, ask, so for the January minutes, the motion was Commissioner Fieselman. It was seconded by Goolsby or Commissioner Calhoun. Uh, I think uh, Vice Chair Goolsby uh, came in first, so we'll, okay. we'll give it to him. Okay. <laughs> okay, before we proceed to swearing in of the witnesses, uh, I will turn it back over to Carla Rosenberg for an announcement. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I sadly um, have some news of departures from the commission. Um, first of all, that we did receive a letter of resignation from Mr. Tom Krieger, um, so he is resigning effective, um, it was a couple weeks ago. And so um, we are going to be advertising an attorney position with the county. Um, so uh, if you know anyone, um, feel free to re refer them um, once I send out the link to that. Um, and then I also have um, the sad news about uh, Jonathan, I'll let him share uh, directly since I haven't received an official notice yet, but um, Jonathan, would you like to share your news as well? Thanks, Carla. So I need to regretfully uh, also uh, resign from the commission. Uh, it's a technicality. Um, I'm uh, going to uh, be a dual resident of uh, Durham and Tel Aviv and most of the month I'll be in Tel Aviv, so probably about a week a month in uh, Durham. And that uh, makes me less of a resident of Durham and not enough probably to uh, uh, fulfill expectations from a uh, commissioner on the Historic Preservation Commission. So regretfully, I have to do that. Um, I think that this commission is really important for the city. I, I was really um, um, honored to, to be able to serve on it uh, for a few years now. Um, I hope that uh, you continue doing the amazing work that you're doing. I know that uh, with Carla and the whole staff, you have an amazing team here, and uh, and we need we need to keep uh, Durham with its soul and history while we continue developing in, in the in the fast pace that is being developed right now. So uh, again, um, I know that Durham is in good hands. I'll be continuing to to watch the commission meetings from the other side now, and probably continue applying with a few uh, buildings downtown coming up soon too. So. Uh, I'm not leaving you, but not going to be on the same uh, um, side of the desk with you. Uh, thanks again. I'm sorry. And uh, regretfully have to do it. And this okay. is effective, by the way. It's go I'm going to resign uh, officially uh, in the next week. Well, well Jonathan, uh, you are and have been such an important voice uh, on this commission. Uh, you've, you've come with an open mind, uh, but with a critical eye. And... Um, 
that perspective is going to be missed and you're going to be missed um, just as a person. Uh, you've been terrific to work with. Um, uh, so I, I take it then today is your last meeting with us. Um, and we certainly look forward to hearing your perspectives today uh, and wish you the, the best of luck uh, going forward. Thank you. Yeah, you Jonathan, too. also just you've been so the, the energy that you bring, the passion, commitment, and such a thorough eye um, to all the cases. It's, it's really been um, a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. So we, we'll miss you. Carla and Jonathan, what is uh, sort of your um, role uh, on, on the commission? Uh, I, I know Tom, we're going to be replacing an attorney position. What is uh, Jonathan's um, position on the board? Uh, real estate. Real estate, okay. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll have someone uh, that will, uh, Carla will speak with soon, uh, or uh, she'll talk to uh, Carla, uh, that has a historic preservation, uh, historic, uh, it, it, Architectural historic uh, uh, master's degree, historian master's degree, and uh, also she has also a side of real estate. I don't know what the technicality or where, where it will fall, but I'll leave it to Carla and then uh, hope she will. Let, I know she will be very, uh, she will fit in, but not my decision to make. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks uh, again. And that is a city position as well. Okay. Carla, can you speak briefly to what? what real estate experience or background you need to sit in a real estate seat? Um, you know, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't researched the, the details on it. I don't, I don't know that there are full descriptions of it. Um, there's sort of the label real estate developer, I believe, um, but I can look into that. And um, when we advertise the commission uh, position, then I'll go ahead and, and put whatever requirements are in there. So I can email that out to all of you and we'll also have it, you know, of course, posted online um, as the public announcement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carla. And thanks, Jonathan. It's been fun doing this together. All right, Jonathan, this is going to be your last rodeo. Let's move forward here with the swearing in of all city staff that we presenting today's cases. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you, members of staff, swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's cases is the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? I do. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department, I do. Before I introduce our first case, uh, I should- Sorry, uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, Chair Bouchard, I probably need to take the oath to Grace Smith, I do, just in case I speak. Thanks. My apologies. I think we also need to backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, Clerk Holmes, uh, you took a roll call vote and we did not hear from Commissioner Hamilton who now appears to be here. All right, Sorry. her now. All right, Commissioner Hamilton. Here. I got you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, let us move forward with our first case, first of two cases today. Uh, this is case number COA 22000. I'm sorry, I should have my glasses on. Let me try this one more time. Case COA 22000001, uh, 1201 Fayetteville Street. Before we hear from any staff, is there any one of our commissioners who may have a conflict of interest in hearing this case? If not, then let us proceed with the swearing in of anyone who plans to speak for or against the case. All right. Do Chair you- oh. oh, Chair Pichard, this is Chris Peterson, Planning Department. Um, I just wanna make an announcement to our attendees. Um, we are trying to bring everyone in as um, panelists right now. I'm trying to bring in Charles, r and Architects, um, as well as Joel Jones. Um, if you are receiving a uh, invite for a panelist, please accept that invite. And if you're having issues, please use the raise hand button. Chris, I am not receiving that notice. Uh, it should be just the attendees um, coming in right now. And I think 
we might have them in. Okay, uh, they're coming in, they're coming online right now. Okay, they're in. Great, let's start with the um, presenter speaking for the case. Uh, Clerk Holmes, if you could uh, once again administer the oath. Yes. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? Uh, well, I do. If each person could state their name and um, whether they agree. Okay, uh, Charles Nicholson, uh, I agree. Joel Jones. Bob Tomlinson, I agree. Mr. Tomlinson, could you give me your first name again, please? Bob Tomlinson. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Tom Jones? Miller, I do. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to do the, the next one in order. Um, I would like to ask each one of the presenters if you consent to this hearing uh, proceeding using this remote electronic platform, and I'm going to go name by name. Um, Mr. Nicholson. I do. Mr. Jones. I do. Mr. Tomlinson. I do. And Mr. Miller. I do. Great. Thank you. We may now proceed with a staff summary. Carla. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Um, sorry, I need to share my screen. Okay. Um, so this is case COA 2200001-1201 Fayetteville Street, modifications. The applicant is R&D Architects represented by Charles Nicholson um, and his colleagues. Um, the owner of the property is Durham County. It's located on the Southeast quadrant of the intersection of Fayetteville Street and East um, Umstead Street, zoned commercial neighborhood. And it's a contributing structure within the Fayetteville Street Historic District. Um, I think it's the Northeast quadrant. If I'm not mistaken, I apologize for that. That's a misprint. Um, I'd like to, um, oh, so the applicant is proposing repairs um, to masonry and a application of waterproof sealants and um, uh, water resistant sealants as well, um, or repellents to replace trim um, around windows and then also to replace um, a, ha a handicap accessibility ramp and to convert an existing doorway into a fixed window, um, multi-light, um, and to remove a non-original um, porch area and convert to um, a plinth um, where some original steps previously existed. So um, I would like to introduce the staff report into the record and invite the applicants to present their case. And if you would like to give me um, a page number, I'm happy to scroll directly to um, that page if, if you have uh, the PDF page number. Okay, thank, thank you, Carla. Um, so I'll start with a little history here. Um, the, the, the building in question here is the Stanford L. Warren Library. It's uh, originally constructed in 1939 uh, in, it's a significant building for the neighborhood in the Fayetteville Street Historic District. Um, the building since the 90s has been suffering under uh, water damage. Uh, it's, it's a masonry building uh, and it's basically in the floodplain, in the, in the groundwater plain, so that water is coming into the building through the foundation. And this has caused um, uh, 
significant issues to the building. Uh, and the county has had two previous efforts to try to stop this water from deteriorating the building. And both of them have failed in that they just didn't take the waterproofing far enough to get it down to the very footing of the building. So, uh, so 1990s, there was a waterproofing project to, uh, to add some drains and to do some water, uh, below grade waterproofing, uh, which helped a little bit, but it just pushed the water from one place to another. Um, and then in 2004, there was some significant uh, additions to the building. The building was renovated and the historic Western entrance, which you can see on page, um, Um, I've moved on my page 17 of the PDF, Carla. So this, this was the historic entrance on the, on the Western side facing Fayetteville street prior to 2004. Uh, in 2004, it was, uh, renovated. And the, in, the main entrance was moved to the south side, which you can see on the next page there. Um, so this is now the current main entrance mm -hmm. with the handicap ramp. Uh, it, it provides the library with a <laughs> functional uh, plan in that uh, they're able to uh, have a lobby to uh, have a circulation desk. Uh, there's, there's adequate room as you enter the building there. Um, whether this in, uh, addition was historically correct or not is, is not the case today. Um, our, our project is trying to solve the water intrusion issues in this structure. So the scope of work that we're proposing is to remove uh, around the entire perimeter of the building, the, the soil down to the footing of the building. So there's a two-story building. You're looking at the main story and below grade is one story. Um, so to get to the foundation, we have to remove um, some area ways, which are shown in I'm not sure if we have a good photograph of those. I think if you go to uh, page 15, yeah, the upper photograph. So this is the west uh, elevation. Um, and behind the bushes uh, at the ground level are areaways for uh, some windows that are below grade. Um, those area ways are a big source of the water intrusion issues. So our, our project is proposing to remove those area ways to block in the windows that are below grade and apply a waterproof foundation system along with a, a kind of a belt and suspenders drainage system to remove the water, the groundwater pressure against the foundation. Uh, we're also going inside the building on the lower level and applying a water uh, a sealant to the top of the floor slab so that we can essentially bathtub the building to keep the water from entering the building. The, the water issues have been fairly severe. Uh, it, currently, the building is vacant because of uh, mold air quality issues. Uh, they've long since had problems with storing books in this facility just because of the high moisture levels due to all the water that's been flowing through the, the lower level. Um, they've got uh, multiple uh, dehumidifiers running at all times in the building and, uh, and still mold is appearing on drywall corners, around doorways, um, any place that typically you see mold growing. Uh, baseboards. Um, so drying the building out so that we can maintain this structure for the future is, is an important part of the, the scope of work. 
In addition to the below grade waterproofing, uh, we are also uh, having to remove that front uh, balcony, I guess is the best word for it. It's not really used as a balcony. So that's again on, on that photograph 17, page 17, Carla, you can see uh, this is the vestige of what was the main stair entrance to the building. Um, the historic photograph is shown on page 14 on the bottom. The stairs were all removed as part of the 2004 project. Uh, so they left this doorway um, inoperable. Uh, it's the county has installed a security door there that that's currently uh, just to keep people from breaking into the library from that side. Uh, they added the, the little railing uh, so that if someone was on this landing, they wouldn't fall off. So if you scroll back just to the top of that photo, Carla, you can see the, uh, um, the railing that's been installed and you can see this uh, door there with kind of the horizontal um, mullions on there that's, that's locked to keep people off the balcony from the interior. So our uh, project to be able to get the waterproofing on uh, appropriately it needs to remove that vestige of a stair and uh, to, uh, to be able to get the waterproofing tied against the building, um, the foundation. So our, our project is proposing to replace that port, uh, porch with a, um, a base, basically a, a plinth for the engaged columns that are around the, the main entrance there. And that is shown in one of our drawings about sheet 26, page 26, Carla. So uh, the idea is to take, to uh, salvage as many existing bricks as we can um, from, from the existing porch to be able to rebuild a, a plant that is, it's only four inches, I believe, in depth. Uh, um, however, it will visually support these, these engaged columns. Um, and, and we're also going to replace the, this security door with a window that is uh, to uh, mimic the, the window as was, was originally designed um, uh, in, in the original construction drawings. Um, so that's this, this window will appear and have a, an appearance as it was originally intended. However, it will not function as a door. It will purely be a window. Um, other changes to the building are we're, we're doing waterproofing on uh, the exterior of the above grade. And um, I will, uh, my counterpart here, Bob Tomlinson is the, our above grade expert. So I will hand this off to him to explain what he's doing, uh, what the plan is for above grade. Bob? Well, thank you, Charles. Um, well, again, the above grade uh, clay and brick masonry mostly. And of course, as you can see in the uh, drawing there, you have highlighted the cast stone coping, the cast stone pediment. There's a cast stone, um, entablature, which of course includes the uh, cornice and the frieze and the architrave. And then there are cast stone bands around the uh, several cast stone bands embedded within the uh, masonry. So um, there's actually uh, the, the, the brick, the clay brick, mostly, uh, particularly on the west elevation of the, they are actually described those as face brick on the west elevate on the west wing. And then you have what they're describing in the uh, original plans as common brick on the uh, east wing. Uh, the face brick on the west wing are generally in very good condition. Uh, the thing we don't know is uh, the, the, the brick 
walls or mass walls. There is no drainage cavity within those walls uh, as is typical for that uh, time of construction. So the water is resisted by so much water until to the point that uh, it is saturated and then eventually dries back out. Uh, these walls, the thicknesses of the walls vary because they're structural walls. The lower portion of the walls are thicker than the upper portion of the walls. Um, you can't, cannot see any evidence of water penetration on the west wing uh, uh, because there's an interior finish of uh, furring and, uh, and, uh, and uh, plaster walls. Fortunately, there has not been enough evidence of water penetrating that damaged those. However, on the east wing where the interior walls are the brick of the walls that are painted, there is evidence of water penetration through those walls. However, when you go outside and investigate those areas that are adjacent to where the paint is peeling internally, there is no clear evidence of openings in the wall. So the assumption is that over periods of time, the walls are simply you know, getting saturated with water and eventually that water comes inside. And then of course, when that happens, it peels the paint internally. So that's pretty much it. So there's a lot of old penetrations, uh, anchors and things like that, that are uh, some pipes and items like that, that are uh, to be removed. And then the, uh, whatever bricks deteriorated, those brick will be replaced. And there is uh, on the west wing, very little, I think, repointing of the masonry that will be required. There is more of that repointing that will be needed actually at the roof level uh, on the interior walls that really are not seen from the outside of the building, but there is some uh, deterioration of the masonry joints, mostly on the uh, east wing. So again, we'll be um, routing and uh, repointing those joints with the mortar as described. It will be a softer mortar to allow for the expansion and contraction of the bricks over a period of time. Uh, and any brick replaced, of course, will be uh, matching the brick that is existing. Uh, so that they does not change the appearance of the building. The recommendation to apply a water repellent, it is a repellent, it is not a coating. A water repellent, um, I don't know if you can, this is basically a, a can of water repellent. If you open it, and I can show you if, if that was actually there, I would show it to you. It looks like water, it's clear. The water repellent is a silane material that is absorbed into the brick and into the mortar joint to the brick. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a sample I put together. I was actually gonna to bring to the meeting, but if you see the air at the top, the side where the air is pointing from that point down to that side actually has this water repellent on there. Uh, so you cannot see it. It basically performs as a, water resistant, doesn't completely keep water from going in, but it keeps water from literally saturating the brick and eventually then going to the inside of the building. So that's really why we recommend the water repellent on the masonry. Uh, and then of course, the restoration of the, um, of the, the, the uh, cast stone uh, cornices, the pediment and the stone bands have significant cracking, deterioration, uh, literally, uh, I guess it's damaged due to weathering over the years and all those items will be uh, repaired. And uh, again, a repellent applied to those items also. So the appearance does not change and you would have a nice consistent look on those cast stone items also. That's it. Yeah, um, Bob, there's there's one more item that we we missed because it's kind of halfway between above grade and below grade. And that, uh, Carla, can you go to uh, page 16? Um, so on the lower, this is the uh, actually oh. the east side. Uh, there's been a uh, stucco panel applied to the the brick on on this side of the building um and bob you did we come up with a reason it was installed there there used to be an areaway on this side um, there was an areaway there and we believe that there was 
probably water uh, proofing. A, uh, a, there is some evidence there that there was a, uh, an asphalt based waterproofing material applied to a portion of that wall. And uh, probably yeah. in lieu of, excuse me. Carla, page uh, 18 on the lower side. There it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can see some remnants of that. Um, so the assumption is that to clean that off, it would have been a uh, very significant physical damage to the brick, probably to the face of the brick. So in lieu of removing that material, they, uh, they put that precast uh, or lathe mounted uh, stucco panel over that area around those windows and along that uh, east elevation. So, and yeah, we're, we're removing that as well uh, to, to be able to make sure we can get the waterproofing appropriately applied below grade and the repellent above grade. Um, right. And of course you can see the security screens that are there. Uh, those security screens will be upgraded um, uh, to actually be true security screens. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, security screens that are there are really not fastened significantly to resist easily being removed. So, um, and then in addition to, because of the, the extent of the amount of renovation it's gonna to take to be able to get down to the footing, we're having to remove uh, nearly all the landscaping on the site. So we have, one tree that we're able to maintain. Um, if you go to sheet 25 of the site plan, um, uh, there's that one 14 inch oak that's on the north side that we're, we're going to be able to uh, save. However, the, the remainder of the trees will need to come out because of having to cut down, get down to 10, 11 feet deep around the, the perimeter of the building will require us to cut back clear to the sidewalk and beyond uh, to have adequate workspace. So we will be replanting all the, we have that same planting plan that was planted in the 2004 project and we'll replace those trees with uh, similar, but smaller trees. And I believe that is everything that we have. So we'll turn it back to you. Th thank you very much. Um, is there anything that Mr. Jones would like to add? No, sir. I think uh, Charles and Bob, they, they covered it pretty well. Great. Okay, before we give the floor to Mr. Miller, I will open the floor to any questions that the commissioners might have for the applicant today. Yeah, Jonathan. Commissioner Dan, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, in uh, the construction drawing 1.0, it's mentioned that Almost all exterior walls, um, I'm, I'm assuming it's the bottom parts, are to be removed. I did not see that in the application and not in the hearing now, so I assume that to be removed does not mean the whole uh, the whole walls. Is that correct? Yeah, we're we're going to leave the exterior walls, <laughs> all of them. So what 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 does it mean? Existing walls to be removed. So we're removing. Uh, mm -hmm. There are uh, these areaways which uh, will be removed and not replaced. Uh, so those are below grade uh, light wells uh, that, that need to be removed to be able to get the waterproofing down to the um, footing level, which is below those areaways. Um, so those will be removed in their entirety um, because they're part of the problem for the water intrusion. Uh, the water is following the, the joints around those areaways to access the building and 
without removing them or unable to waterproof the wall below the areaways. We're also removing the handicap ramps. The 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 handicap ramp is no, yeah, that's a part of the uh, um, application. Uh, but so, thank you for that clarification. If I may, uh, Carla, is that part of the uh, possible motion? Did I miss that? Sorry. Um. So. I don't necessarily include every single detail. So if that is considered to be an important, um, we, we by all means add it to the motion. Sometimes I miss, um, otherwise our motions would be. Oh, if very, you don't, very, very I, I think that, I, I don't know, maybe it's not important, uh, but it's uh, it's practically all the surrounding uh, walls. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and I think that should be added to the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Vice Chair Goolsby wanted to ask a question. Uh, yes. Um, actually, a follow up to to Jonathan's question. So the area ways are being removed. Um, does are the windows that the area ways serving are they higher than the area ways, or is it? I guess the real question is: any work being done to those windows? So uh, yeah, good question. The, the windows are below grade, so that's why the areaways are needed. So the windows will be filled in with a uh, combination of con concrete block and and the waterproofing. Um, uh, there are actually, I've, in addition to the waterproofing, we are adding a layer of insulation to to the foundation as well. So that'll help improve with energy on the on that lower level. Um, but yes, the windows are they're being removed and infilled with concrete block. Okay, and then effectively waterproofed and backfilled. So we, you will not see those windows ever again. You will not see them. You will see them on the inside. There'll be a vestige of them. Um, today, you can't see those windows either. As you see in those photographs, they're not visible. And because of the waterproofing issues, most of the areaways are covered with plywood to try to keep rainwater out of them to, mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of water that's just draining into the basement. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Uh, second question is about the water repellent. Um, is, is this, are these products that you guys have used before? Is it, uh, what have been the effects of the brick? Does it give it glossy textures? Does it change the color? Um, is it something you guys have tested on the building thus far? And have, has city staff seen any of that? Um, I guess just getting more clarity than knowing that it's a clear when it comes out of the can uh, would, would be helpful. <laughs> The water repellent, when it's applied, it does not change the appearance of the mortar or the brick. You cannot tell that it is there until you throw water on it and you see the water repels. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, it does not change the appearance of the brick or the mortar joints. Yeah, and to follow up on that, we, we have used... Uh, this product or very similar products on, on several historic buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it, we, the old health building in downtown Raleigh, uh, and we've applied it oh, recently at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park's not a historic building, but it's a brick structure. We applied it on the entire building. It, you, it's, you just don't know it's been applied. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had a lot of success with certain ones. What what is the product, the company, and product? And Bob, I'll let you go. That it's a siloxane. You're on mute, Bob. You're talking to yourself, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> We've only been doing this for a couple of years now. <laughs> there we go. 
Uh, well, I, I was I was clicking on the wrong button. So, well, you know, at being a public project, of course, we have to specify more than one. Um, the one that I held the can up earlier was uh, by uh, Emco Technologies. It is a um, they describe it as clear steel. Let's say high performance hydrophobic silane sealer. So basically, the intent is that you have a high content of silane that is in any of the materials that we specify, and that is the material that is absorbed into the brick that applies the uh, water repellent characteristics uh, of the product. It is a, I think the fancy terminology today is nanotechnology. All that means is that it goes deep, it penetrates into whatever it be, concrete, brick, mortar, whatever it might be. To, uh, to provide that water resistance. Uh, it is not waterproof. It is designed to be on a vertical above grade surface. So it is not waterproofing, it's a water repellent. And uh, it's, yeah, of course we don't, you know, wax cars anymore, but uh, <laughs> that's what I would compare it to. Uh, something that goes on that gives you protection uh, that doesn't change the appearance of the substrate below. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Um, I would recommend that we uh, obtain some cut sheets of the product selected, both the water repellent and the water sealant um, for the record. Um, however, whether it's approved or continued today, that would be helpful. Um, I also had well, a few uh, questions as staff. Another thing is when the, when the project starts, you know, we, will all, we always, just to, to back up, we always do find a, uh, like up at the roof level, we would go up on that roof level and we would apply some of the material uh, to uh, make sure that it does what we said it does, does not to change the appearance of the brick um, or any other substrate that it may be applied to. And I would suggest someone with city, city staff, Carl, I don't know if that's you or not, um, getting, getting eyes on it. Okay. Um, and I had some other questions as well. Um, First of all, um, to know whether you had um, considered alterations to the building, like other, like any sort of infrastructure that would redirect the water from where it is saturating the brick and creating this water intrusion problem. Um, you know, one of the best practices would be to just try to eliminate the water problem at the source. Um, so that's one question I had. Um, another I had was um, just getting clarification on the extent, are you proposing to um, cover the every exposed brick on the building? Is it full extent? Um, and then I, the third, I think I know the answer, it's it's not removable. That once it's absorbed, it's it's there and it will never come off. That was, that's my third question. Well, it will, you know, any water repel it like that, uh, it used to be you'd almost have to, you know, the older technology, you almost have to apply it like every five years. And uh, the newer technology, it's, you know, 10 plus years before you reapply it again. So it is, it is not permanent. Uh, it does uh, literally like anything that's on the exterior of the brick would uh, age and technically wash away over a period of time and would be, would be reapplied uh, as, as needed to maintain the building. Uh, it is completely uh, applied in a fluid form uh, most of the time on a project where you do not want the material to go on any other windows or anything like that or plants or whatever. Uh, it would be applied by roller literally from bottom to top uh, so that it flows to make sure you get full coverage. And to answer your first question, Carla, um, so the, we, we, we did an extensive study before we came up with a design solution on, on where, where we're finding the water, where is the water intrusion happening. Um, the below grade piece is groundwater. The, uh, the county had installed a groundwater monitoring well, uh, and it clearly the groundwater is sitting about right at the floor level of the basement. So the, the footing is constantly in water. And during um, rain events, uh, water 
the groundwater level is about four inches above the floor level. So that's adding uh, considerable water pressure to the, to the walls at, at their base. Um, and then we've also looked at uh, the part of the project which we haven't talked about is, is some roofing uh, work that's being done to uh, redirect the uh, overflow drains to, to capture the water in a better manner and get it off the roof uh, without having it run down the the outside of the water on the on the west side there is an overflow drain that pretty much runs constantly if there's any rainfall at all so we are reworking uh, the center of the roof uh, to so it'll drain better um, and to reduce uh, re-roofing a section of the roof to reduce leaks in, in that portion of the roof as far as keeping water off the exterior uh, the there is without adding an overhang around the building there's there would be no way to reduce that amount of the the rainfall uh, that's hitting the outside of the brick um so okay that's, that's that, helpful. that was our that that was our thoughts there yeah that's helpful to know that you had done some work in that area and obviously direct rain hit you can't prevent so can't stop that no and <laughs> part of the uh and, and bob mentioned earlier the 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 cornice uh the, the stone the cast stone around the uh perimeter which does add does have a little bit of a effect of catching some water so it'll drip a, away from the brick itself um, but that is uh, in poor condition, and, and we are repointing uh, those areas that, so that we can and um, repairing those those damaged units so that uh, so and applying the water repellent so that water does not soak into those uh, sealant those joints and those units as much so that we can try to keep that water get it off the building quicker. Looks like uh, ask, Diane has a question. Yeah, it's a follow up really on the roof. Uh, again, that's new to me. Maybe I missed it. Is the work on what is the work on the roof? Does it include coping? Does it, uh, the coping? Does it include uh, the exposed uh, the front entrance uh, canopy? So, uh, Carla, can you go to page twenty three? That's the uh, the photograph of the roof and, and Bob, I'll, I'll let you describe the scope of the work on the roof. Well, the, the, the roof, um, there's only three areas of the roof that are to be replaced. The west wing, the east wing roof and the lower center roof area, the roofing on the additions that were done in 2004 will not be replaced. So that's just basically a cost saving effort. Existing cast stone parapets on, on the top of the wall, the west wing will be maintained just like they are. No appearance change. There is a current metal coping cap that was not original to the building on the east wing parapet walls. So because maybe they have been established as being historic, those coping caps, we will be putting new metal coping, sheet metal coping to replace the existing sheet metal coping on the east wing. In one, I'm sorry, is that, did I miss that? Was that part of the application? The material at least for the coping? Whether it's or just it's it's replacing like with like. Um, I think if you go to page sixteen on the top image, you can see it's hard to see there, but at the top of that is that the metal coping that'll be replaced with the same coping. And and then if you go to the Page 15, you can, wow. 
yeah, there we go. You can kind of see that the, 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 the cast stone there, then that's being maintained. So that there you can see the two side by side. I promise you the metal that we put on there <laughs> will look a lot better and last a lot longer than the metal that's there on the east wing. The current metal is, is, it is um, just uh it's it's not uh kind of coated it is rusting uh it is literally held in place with asphalt mastic uh basically glued in place uh otherwise i would have probably tried to remove that metal and actually bring bring it back to the original stone look but uh we just because of the condition of that stone and what they've done to it it's best just to remove the existing metal and put new uh kind of coated metal on there and Ultimately, the owner will select the color, but basically, it's it's currently a, a gray uh, as it is, and we'll make sure the owner selects whatever color you like there. Thank you. Um, this is Commissioner Hamilton. Are y'all putting in new foundation drains or anything like that in conjunction with the waterproofing? Or are you going to get down there and do like an exploratory, figure out what the current drainage is? So, <laughs> so, so we've already done the exploratory digging. We I had a contractor out there and dug several test pits to find out what was going on. Uh, we've also camera as far as we could get a camera to run down the lines to figure out where the lines are actually going. Um, and basically what we found was nothing is really working that's there. So we're replacing it with uh, a kind of a dual drain system uh, on the foundation on top of the waterproofing will be a drainage board. And on the bottom of that will be a system called a hydro duct, which will pick up the water that's in the drainage board and take that away. And then as a backup, just because we know the amount of groundwater uh, that'll be at the floor level, we're running a, a, a separate um, perforated pipe 18 to two feet in out from the footing level to that'll be slightly uh, lower than the floor level and then continually to slope downwards till we can get it to the uh, to the northeast corner of the building, which then will take it out to the street. So, yeah, we're trying to, yeah, it's a belt and suspenders. It's it's an extensive waterproofing project. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant from any of our commissioners? Uh, yes, this is Andy Coles again. Um, can you clarify the extent of uh, repair around the windows? Um, I think maybe we were, it was uh, described by somebody else as uh, replacing. Um, Well, the existing wood at those Palladi windows, there's one on the south elevation and then one on the north elevation of the west wing. Uh, the existing wood, um, I would say, is probably in the range of 70 to 80 percent deteriorated, literally falling off the building. Um, so the existing drawings are available to show the uh, characteristics of that wood uh, and the uh, profile of that wood. And uh, so, of course, the existing profile is still there, and all that wood is anticipated to be replaced to match the existing profile. The windows themselves were replaced, inserts were replaced uh, in uh, 2004, or actually maybe before that, um, uh, and those windows are currently, uh, appear to be vinyl-coated metal muntins, uh, and insulated glass. But we'll only be treating, only be upgrading the wood around the perimeter. Okay. Um, 
And the infill doorway, is it of the same material as, as these win those window replacements? Or it's aluminum, right? That's correct. It's an aluminum frame. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Commissioners, any additional questions? If not, I will ask just a couple of follow-ups. Um, gentlemen, are any of uh, you or is anybody on your team a structural engineer? Uh, we have uh, not on the not on our witness here, but we do have a structural engineer who's part of the project. Who is that structural engineer? Uh, it's uh, Bill Easterly, a gardener named Daniel. And has Mr. Easterly been uh, consulted with respect to some of the issues that we've heard concerns about addressed today? Um, uh, concerns about. Uh, the, the impact that the repellent might have on historic masonry um, and the potential that the masonry could be compromised over time as a result of the repellent. Um, I do not know if, if uh, Bill is actually weighed in on this particular project, but he's worked with us on multiple historic renovation projects where we've applied uh, waterproofing repellents or water repellents and uh, he has had no issue with those. But but just so I'm, I'm clear, he has not been consulted on this project? He, he's been consulted about uh, stru structural issues on the project and has, has no issues with what we've, I mean, he's reviewed everything. He's provided the design documents for uh, all the the rebuilding of the found foundations uh, for the ramps, and, it, uh, and he has he's had no concerns about the project. Your precise question, as we've asked him about the water repellent application, uh, I haven't asked him that precise question for this particular project. Yet, although we've we've worked with him on many projects where we've applied it, and uh, he's never had any issue with it in the past. Thank you very much. That's all I have. If there are no other commissioners with questions, I will ask if there's anybody else here to speak on behalf of the proposal. And seeing and hearing from none, I will now invite um, anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to the application uh, to speak, and I believe that would be Mr. Miller. Oh, I think you're still on mute. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is funny. We've been doing this for two years, and we I guess we get lazy over time. Um, my name is Tom Miller. I'm president of uh, Preservation Durham. And I wanted to clarify for the record that Preservation Durham has no objection to the project, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did have a couple of questions that, uh, that the commission members' questions uh, raised. Uh, uh, I, too, have some concerns about the, uh, the water repellent, uh, and if I may ask them. Sure, present your concerns, then we'll uh, re return to the um, applicant uh, once we have a list of those concerns. All right, thank you very much. So my, my first question is, this is a water repellent. It does not uh, uh, completely keep the water out. Uh, and, and the concern that I have is, what effect does the water repellent uh, have on the ability of the brick it's applied to, to, to dry out? And I'm a... And, I'm a little concerned, especially about those brick surfaces like the parapet, uh, where the repellent might be applied both inside and outside, whether or not it might actually work to retain water. Um, uh, and it may be exposed those surfaces to uh, spalling or, or freeze thaw, thaw problem. 
Uh, and then also with regard to the repellent is uh, if you did not use the repellent, is there a practical alternative? Uh, was it considered uh, and, uh, and why was the repellent chosen over the alternative if there is one? And then finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, concerning uh, the groundwater um, uh, drainage system, I'm assuming that we're going to have a drainage system that will be installed that will achieve kind of an optimum water flow to self clean it, uh, to clean itself out. And I'm assuming that the slope on the property is such that uh, these uh, drainage lines will ultimately achieve the surface uh, of the ground at some point near that northeast corner. And then where does the water go that is collected from a building of this size? Uh, does, does it go on to the surface somewhere? I heard you say it goes to the street, but uh, it, where does it go then? And is there any kind of catchment to slow the, the flow. And those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I will turn it uh, back over. Well, I guess, I guess to follow proper protocol, um, I should ask any of my commissioners, my, my colleagues, if they have any uh, questions about your questions um, <laughs> before I give the applicant a chance to speak. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Mr. Nicholson or anybody else who would like to uh, speak in response to those three questions. So uh, I will uh, refer to Bob on the on the water repellent because tasked him with that uh, that issue. So Bob, you want to answer that question? Oh well, the again the the water repellent is. It's exactly what it is. It repels water. It does not impede. It is not a coating. Uh, the breathability or uh, of the of, of the masonry uh, of any form. So uh, it simply resists the amount of moisture that is allowed to enter the masonry, so that it it does actually dry off quicker. Uh, there is so any moisture that you know, currently would be in the masonry um, is not resisted from re of drying out to the exterior, whether it be on the cast stone or whether it be on the uh, clay brick masonry and the mortar joints. Um, the alternate uh, would be to be to uh, clean the building more frequently, um, which I don't recall that the exterior of that building uh, has been cleaned. I don't, it may have been done when they did the restorations in uh, 2004. So we're now looking at uh, 2006, we're looking at multiple years of exterior uh, soiling. Uh, you can call it black soiling, staining uh, of the, uh, particularly the cast stone. The uh, brick doesn't seem to show it as much, but the cast stone, uh, pediments, cornices, uh, and the, um, uh, are severely soiled at this time. And uh, there's, you can't see it in the pictures, but at the roof level on the top of those cast stone, there's literally algae growing uh, on top of those uh, stones. So again, the, the more moisture that you can keep out, the less of that um, uh, mold or black soiling, as they call it, is going to have growth, particularly on the north elevations, because the quicker it dries out, the, the less that uh, you're going to have that growth on the exterior of the masonry. Thanks, Bob. Um, and then the question about um, the where the, the capturing of the stormwater at the foundation, uh, at the footing level. Uh, Carla, if you go to uh, sheet 25, the site plan. So this project, uh, we spent some time to find an unchartered uh, storm sewer pipe. Uh, if you zoom out in Umstead Street in the north of our project. Uh, there in the street is a sanitary sewer 
Uh, you gotta zoom out a little further, <laughs> please. Uh, yeah. If I got, oh, I, I see. Okay, I, I have a different plan up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go to sheet uh, twenty-four. That one's showing it. Um, so on the top there, you can see that uh, the the limits of excavation there goes across the street to a uh, a storm pipe that we found. Uh, it was an uncharted one, but we had to have it cameraed to find it. Uh, so we will be taking the below grade water directly into storm water. Um, and, and as far as being able to clean this in the future, so the two pipes we're putting down there, one of them will be a perforated uh, pipe, uh, the, the flexible perforated pipe, which is difficult to clean. The other one will be a smooth walled uh, PVC pipe. So we'll be, that will be able to be cleaned uh, and will inherently uh, less, uh, in, less chance of it filling up with silt um, because you'll get better flow out of it. Is, does that answer your questions, Tom? Uh, yes, completely. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, all of my questions have been answered and, and I conclude my remarks by saying Preservation Durham has begun an examination of uh, uh, preservation issues on the Fable Street corridor from essentially the freeway down to the North Carolina Central University campus. This building is exceptionally important, uh, not only to the corridor, but to the, um, uh, the history of Durham and uh, we're delighted to see uh, this much attention being given to it. Um, and uh, we look forward to the time when the library reopens. And we have no objection to the COA that's been applied for in this application. Mr. Miller, thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak either for or against this application? I just want to say thank you to the applicants for putting in the work to help this building be a long-term asset in our community. It sounds like this is not an easy project and you've done a lot of diligence in how to care for it. So thank you for that. I'm now going to close the public hearing uh, so that we can have a discussion um, among commissioners. Is there anyone who would like to lead us off? I'll say, um, Ms. Andy Wilsby, it's, it's never an easy task to be able to do this. Um, we've, we've had to gone to extreme like this on a couple of buildings to help keep the water out. So um, what, what I've heard are uh, a lot of standards of practice that, that we also apply to our buildings uh, to be able to help with water intrusion. Um, so nothing, nothing jumps out as concerns uh, except for the uh, area ways that um, would be removed and the windows being infilled uh, and, and didn't know how the fellow commissioners felt uh, about about that aspect of it. Thank you, Vice Chair Goolsby. Does any of any of our other commissioners want to address either um, Vice Chair Goolsby's concern uh, about the area white walls and the infill of the windows or any other issues related to this application? Jonathan Dan, um, I agree with Andy, um, Commissioner Boltzby. Um, the area ways and the windows uh, are a concern, but on the other hand, I can't, from what I'm hearing, I can't really see another option. And I think that they covered most of the options and that would, and to do all this work in the end and have water under the building is not going to be very beneficial to anyone. Uh, so it's between the two. And as long as engineering and uh, structurally it's sound, uh, I think we'll lose the element of the airways, but, uh, but we gain the uh, preservation of the building. Thank you, Commissioner Dayan. Anyone else? 
and and well said, Jonathan. Too bad you're leaving. <laughs> so my only concern is is as reflected in the, the question um, or series of questions that I asked, um, and it, it really arises from what we've seen here in the staff report uh, about the potential for uh, the water repellent to actually trap water. The only testimony we have heard in this hearing is that that is not the case. Um, and I think based on the weight of the evidence um, that has been presented at this hearing, um, I think de facto my concern has been addressed. I, I, I think I would have felt a little bit more confident um, had the structural engineer been consulted uh, to specifically address the potential impact of applying water repellent at all elevations. Um, but again, the, the, the testimony that did come in that we did receive uh, was that, um, and this was really in uh, direct answer to Mr. Miller's question, uh, that uh, the repellent quote does not impede uh, breathability of the masonry, it just resists the amount of uh, moisture um, that uh, that masonry might be, uh, that might, that masonry might absorb. And so um, based on the evidence that's been received, uh, I am satisfied. Um, although I, again, just will note for the record, I, it, I would have been really satisfied if, if we had the recommendation of a structural engineer saying that this was uh, the right product and the right application. Any other commissioners? Hey, Chair Broussard, I would, I would add to that. Sometimes it's, it's helpful to have um, a consultant who is an um, uh, exterior. Uh, we, we often use the phrase uh, envelope consultant, someone who specializes in exteriors who can comment on, on that, um, particularly ones who have dealt with historic structures um, to be able to say these are the products that we've seen successful or you know, is it even warranted? Um, so I'll just add that in terms of future, future projects and when this comes up again. It's a great observation. Thank you. So Mr. Bouchard, this is Mr. DeBerry. Um, the more, the more we talk about our concerns around this, uh, this application of applying this stuff, I'm aware of a project in Chapel Hill, a much older building, uh, different, it is brick largely but also some stucco and they had similar issues and they they covered it with something and it's been a number of years so this may be a newer product but they had a lot of trouble with spall and with the uh, surface of the brick chipping off because moisture was somehow getting in behind this protective coating and then popping you know the fascia of the brick off and it was a mess and so if this if this stuff is better, newer, different technology, um, that's great. But yeah, I'd, I'd love a, a second opinion or at least a, a confirmation that um, we're not gonna have that problem here. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. I was gonna wait till my recommendation to put this forward, but um, I'll say now that you know there is the opportunity also to put a condition for staff approval. Staff will gain um, some, uh, some insights from either National Park or Service Techn Technology Preservation Services Department um, and or SHPO um, as to the products used if, if the applicant is able to provide a cut sheet for that product. Um, when he mentioned the name, I, I had not heard of it before, um, but we aren't wed to a particular product, um, but um, SHPO and TPS would um, be familiar with the products and their performance. And so um, I I would feel comfortable with the blessing of either of those departments um, in going forward with it. As would I. Carla, would, would the condition be that not only the cut sheets for those um, products be submitted, but also that they be approved by one of these organizations you've just referenced? Right. And could you give me those? Yeah, exactly. What were those organizations yes. again? Um, so it's uh, North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. They have a rehabilitation services Div division. Um, and then there's National Park Service, which is over the SHPOs, and they have a technical preservation services department. And 
and the TPS is actually who wrote the brief that I believe I attached as attachment three, um, which specifically states to not um, use water repellents, which is why we're having this conversation. And, um, but as you know, Mr. Berry said, perhaps this is a newer product that um, maybe performs differently from what is being referenced in, in that brief. I'm still on the uptake here, Carla. Um, TPS, uh, what's that Techni organization? Technical Preservation Services. I'm with it's you. It's a division of the National Park Service. I'm with you. Thank you. Yeah, the brief, this angle, the brief is kind of funny because, you know, it, it says not to use it in their other part where it says it might, when it might be appropriate. So, <laughs> So there's I perhaps love to have a straightforward nuance. answer sometimes. <laughs> right. And Carla, does, does TPS operate not only within the National Park Service, but also within the uh, North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office? So they are, um, the National Park Service is sort of the umbrella organization for the SHPOs. The SHPOs um, receive their funding and, and sort of their, they're like, each of the 50 states gets a SHPO that is under the National Park Service. Okay. And their tribal organizations as well. For the, well, for the yeah. purposes of potentially drafting a condition, of course, I'm going to ask the applicant if this is a condition that they can live with before we- Exactly. And they would, need to, they would need to sign off on it as well on the yeah. actual document. No doubt. But in terms of the wording, are, are we um, suggesting the submission of cut sheets that need to be approved by the TPS of the National Park Service? Is that- the sub submission or yeah, the submission of cut sheets for the products, the water um, repellent. I personally am less concerned about the, the um, sealant because it's underground and that is a recommended application for it. But um, I think it would be good to have both those, the, the sealant and the repellent have cut sheets for those, submit them for review by the NC uh, Historic Preservation Office or the Technical Preservation Services Unit of the National Park Service. Got it. I will turn to the applicant and for the purposes of uh, this question and this discussion, reopen the public hearing. Um, is the applicant, um, willing to accept a condition um, on uh, approval of this application uh, that would require the submission of cut sheets for uh, the waterproofing sealant as well as the uh, water repellent uh, to Carla uh, for submission and approval uh, to um, the NC State Historic Preservation Office or the TPS unit of the National Park Service. I'm speaking for Joel here, but uh, I would say yes. Um, I'd, quick clarification, the below grade is not a, it's a membrane, not a, not a waterproofing mastic or uh, coating. It's okay. actually a membrane. Um, and, uh, and yeah, no, no problems. I mean, we've, We've used this uh, siloxane, uh, saline uh, water repellent on other SHPO products. Uh, we worked with Mitch Wild in the past and, and, and his folks. So, um, yeah, we, we can do that. Are you good with that, Joel? Yes, sir. Yeah, I got to take uh, take your expert opinion there. So I'll, I'll leave it to to your um, your intuition. Yes, sir. And I would also like to uh, um, clarify that uh, um, Bob Tomlinson is an envelope uh, consultant, uh, REI engineers. Uh, that's what they do for a living, and uh, so uh, we do have an envelope consultant that has looked at this project extensively. In fact, he's the prime contract. <laughs> he's the one who's uh, was originally hired to 
to pr design this project. And, and we were brought on to, to assist. Well, like I say, we have done multiple historic restorations of uh, the Superior Court building downtown Raleigh just a few years back. Uh, you know, did significant uh, restorations of those exteriors, marble uh, cleaning, uh, and then of course they had that nice yellow brick uh, and uh, the substantial brick replacement and uh, mortar joint replacement and then a water repellent was applied to the ex complete exterior of that building, excluding the marble stones. Uh, but the clay brick masonry did apply, did have an application of water repellent, a silane, so like the same water repellent applied. Okay, so. Thank you all very much for your willingness to accommodate that condition. Um, if there is anyone uh, else who would like to make any comments, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I intend to ask Carla for a staff recommendation. Matt, this is uh, Chair Goldsby, or Chair Pichard, excuse me. Um, you also, I, I saw you take some good notes there, so I assume you might be reading a motion for us. Um, <laughs> That's the intent. You, you also have the removing all area ways in full and uh, make, putting masonry in the windows. Andy, if I read that as um, uh, remove uh, all areaways uh, and walls associated with the areaways um, as shown on drawing CD 1.0 and infilling uh, impacted windows uh, with masonry, would, would that be sufficient? That sounds fine. Thanks. Okay. And I guess the, the other question I'll ask uh, both of staff and of the commissioners is whether or not we need to make reference expressly to um, uh, any of the coping uh, on the roof being replaced because right now that is not the possible motion either. Carla Rosenberg Planning Department, I think it would be fine to, to note it. We, we haven't heard, it, it's not an original uh, material, um, but since it was discussed specifically, we could go ahead and state that non-original um, metal coping will be replaced with new metal coping. Great. Carla, may we have a staff recommendation? Sure, Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Staff would recommend approval of the application uh, with the condition of, um, the, of a staff review um, of the products selected for um, sealing the lower levels and um, the water repellent applied to the upper levels. Um, and I think the condition should also be worded to allow, um, we don't wanna negate the entire COA just in case SHPO weren't to approve it. And we're, we're assuming this is gonna sail past SHPO and it, and it will be approved and um, there won't be an issue, but in the off chance that it weren't approved um, to just say that if not approved, then this, uh, this item will be removed from the scope and the rest of the scope can proceed. Majapin, if that's the case, why don't we leave it? We do have an expert for envelope here. This is just a suggestion, but if we do, I, and, I, and I wasn't aware of that before, we did hear an expert on envelope uh, uh, saving. Can we do it as a courtesy if they can do it and we can have it so it's not part, you know, part of the COA, uh, um, Sorry, the COA uh, motion. Sorry. Sorry, what was your suggestion again? To I'm add? suggesting not to add the an additional requirement for uh, expertise on the envelope uh, sealant, because we have had heard uh, we had heard from uh, from a specialist on this. And if I'm not if I'm uh, understanding yeah. correctly. Yeah. Well, staff's recommendation is to go ahead and get SHPO's or NPS's um, 
blessing that's just my recommendation and you all can um, act, make the decision that you want to. Carla, does that recommendation apply mm -hmm. to the uh, repellent or also to the waterproofing membrane that's been mentioned? Um, I think, I think the repellent is the of the most concern that's specifically um, what was warned against in the brief. Okay, well, I'm going to attempt a motion. The Durham Historic Preservation Commission finds that in the case COA 2200001, 1201 Fayetteville Street modifications. The applicant is proposing modifications to a contributing structure, an existing brick porch with railing and entry door, neither original to the structure, at the west portico will be replaced with a brick plinth, one feet deep, excuse me, one feet deep and matching original bricks, and a six light white aluminum framed storefront window within the same opening, respectively. All areaways will be removed. Walls associated with such areaways will be removed. All is shown on drawing CD-1.0 with all impacted windows being infilled with masonry. Deteriorated bricks in areaways below grade will be removed and salvaged for reuse in the new plinth and ramps. Existing handicap ramps, not original, will be replaced with new brick, precast stone, and concrete handicap ramps to match the color, tone, and texture of original materials on the structure and new emergency wall lighting installed. Waterproof coatings will be applied only to bricks below grade. Water repellent coatings will be applied to all exposed masonry surfaces. Original wood trim will be replaced with new wood trim cut to match in size, form, and details. Non-original metal coping will be replaced with new metal coping. 11 street trees will be removed, saving one oak on the north side of the building and new street trees, three trident maples, eight crepe myrtles planted. Therefore, the conclusion of law is that the proposed addition and alterations are consistent with the historic character and qualities of the historic district and are consistent with the historic properties local review criteria, specifically those listed in the staff report. And the Durham Historic Preservation Commission approves the certificate of appropriateness for case COA 22 Zero 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 one, twelve oh one Fayetteville Street modifications with the following conditions. One, the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and testimony presented to the commission at this commission hearing and attached to the COA. Two, the improvements may require additional approvals from other city or county departments or state or local agencies. The applicant is responsible for obtaining all required approvals relating to building construction site work and work in the right of way. Three, a compliance inspection shall be performed immediately upon completion of the work approved herein. And four, the applicant shall sub submit to city staff cut sheets for the water repellent applicant intends to utilize for submission by city staff to the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office or the Technical Preservation Services Unit of the National Park Service for their approval. If not approved, the water repellent shall be removed from the scope of work approved by the COA and the remainder of the work shall be permitted to go forward. Second. Chair Wilson, or Dr. Chair Wilson. Dr. Combs, if we can have a roll call vote, please. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. 
Commissioner Dan. Approved. Commissioner DeBerry. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Approved. Vice Chair Goolsby. Approved. Commissioner Hamilton. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes seven to zero. I want to thank all of you so much for your patience with this process. I want to thank Mr. Miller for his contributions as well. Um, I think we had a, a robust discussion about some of the technical concerns, and um, I, I like the way those concerns are going to be addressed and, and thrilled that y'all are moving forward with this project that's going to preserve uh, such an important asset on Fayetteville Street. So thank you all very much, and, and good luck with the project. Thank you all for all your attention to detail here. It's, it's appreciated from the design side as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fellow, fellow commissioners, that went a little bit longer than anticipated, but I think it was a good discussion. Um, I would go ahead and uh, propose a five minute break and return at 1045. Agreed. See you back here shortly. Thank you.
Hey, Matt, are you there? If Cindy Hoffman and Jeff Kurtz are available, um, we are trying to promote you as panelists, and that is so that you can participate in the next public hearing. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey, Matt. <clears throat> I'm, worried, I'm worried I'm not going to get very deep into this case and want to ask you permission to just go ahead and be excused now. Is that all right? Yeah, I, I think that's fine. My, my sense is we will not have an opportunity to um, vote on this case before your uh, 11 o'clock deadline today. So that that that's fine. OK, great. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Nice to see you. Jeremy Shard, uh, I know I'm. Nope. Ahead, I just said bye to Laura. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I, no, I missed the beginning of the meeting, but I'm just letting you know that I will be recusing myself from the next case. Okay. So we still have a quorum, correct? We still have five? I think we do. Amanda, could you check? Yes. Okay. So who is out? So Faisalman is gone. And Commissioner Hamilton, you said you wouldn't be able to? Yeah, I'll be recusing myself. Okay. So one, two, three. Yeah, we have five. Okay. I believe our applicant is still, well, actually I think our applicant is here now. Ms. Hoffman, Mr. Kurtz, good to see you. Hi. And Mr. Miller is still here. Tom, if you could put your camera on when you have a chance. Just so we know, know that you're here. I can't, but, oh, now I can, okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, I believe we have everybody back. So we will now proceed with hearing the next case on our agenda. That is case COA 2200002, 501 Washington Street. And just so this is on uh, the record formally, uh, before we hear from staff, is there any one of our commissioners who may have a conflict of interest in hearing this case? I'm Chair Rishari, Commissioner Hamilton. I have a conflict of interest having worked on this project with my former employer. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. Uh, we still have with us Vice Chair Goolsby, Commissioner Dayon, Commissioner DeBerry, um, and... Um, Commissioner Calhoun. Uh, so those four commissioners, um, with myself being the fifth, gives us a quorum, and so we will continue. Uh, Clerk Holmes, if you could please uh, administer the oath uh, to Ms. Hoffman, uh, Mr. Kurtz, and to Mr. Miller. All right. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth, by your own knowledge or by information and belief? I'm Miller, I do. Cindy Hoffman, I do. And I do. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go one by one here by name. Uh, do each of you consent to this hearing proceeding today on this remote electronic platform? Ms. Hoffman? Yes, I do. Mr. Kurtz? Yes, I do. And Mr. Miller? Yes. Thank you all very much. If we uh, could have our staff report, Carla. <clears throat> hey, Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. This is KCOA 220002, 501 Washington Street, demolition. Um, it's an amendment to a previous application. Um, the applicant is Stuart, represented by Cindy Hoffman. The owner is Magnolia Fire Tower Place, LLC. It's located on the northwest quadrant of the intersection of Washington Street 
and Corporation Street. It's zoned Downtown Design Support 1, um, and it's a historic landmark, not in a district. It's the city garage and fire tower. Um, the previous uh, COA was for demolition of all um, accessory structures and two additions um, on this property. And this um, amendment is uh, a new strategy for um, salvaging portions of the of one of those structures um, and repurposing um, on the site. So I'd like to introduce the staff report into the record and invite um, Ms. Hoffman to present her case. Uh, thank you. I would just like to uh, start with a quick introduction and just a recap of where we've been. Um, for uh, everyone, as a reminder, we brought this case originally to uh, the commission in October of 2021 and presented the demolition of the structures on this site. At that time, we were given a 365 day delay for the demolition of those structures with the primary concern being the employee's restroom that is located on the site. Um, the 365 day delay was uh, issued to give us time to work with Preservation Durham to uh, one, address their overall concerns for the project, the scale of the buildings and the architectural direction of it. And two, to work with Preservation Durham to find a possible reuse for the employee restroom. Um, since that time, we presented several plans to them and have worked with Preservation Durham to come up with a strategy for a reuse of the portion of the employee's bathroom on the site that we think is a, a good solution for it. And that uh, without speaking for Mr. Miller, that I think that we're all um, in agreement on the location, the size and the scale of it. Um, Cindy will present those plans to you in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but just to summarize again, that this has been, uh, this is the result of several months of, of coordination and cooperation between our design team and Preservation Durham to come up with the strategy. Uh, we'll continue to work with Preservation Durham during this process. Uh, one of the things that we're proposing is to place a plaque on the restroom structure and we'll work with Preservation Durham on the language of that plaque to commemorate what the previous use of the building had been um, so that it is uh, memorialized in the, the new structure. So uh, Cindy, if you wanna take it over and present the plans. Sure, good morning. My name is Cindy Hoffman. I'm representing the applicant uh, for the 501 Washington Street property. I'm a licensed professional landscape architect in North Carolina with over 20 years experience and a senior project manager at Stewart in Durham. Um, a major, as Jeff has um, previously mentioned, a major certificate of occupancy for demolition of the accessory structures, except for the fire drill tower, and de demolition of two city garage additions were approved on October 5th with the condition of the 365 day delay. The site also received a second certificate of appropriateness on December 7th for the construction of a new mixed use building addressing the future Durham Beltline with the appropriate frontage and um, congruous to the two primary historic structures on site. We're here today requesting a major certificate of appropriateness amendment um, for the relocation and repurposing of the historic city garage employee restroom um, and elimination of the 365 day delay, demolition delay. Carly, can you turn to page 10? Thank you. <laughs> Just a kind of a recap of the site and the existing conditions. Uh, the site is located at 501 Washington Street. It's a predominant visible site at the corner of Washington and West Corporation Street, adjacent to and east of the existing abandoned railroad and future Durham Beltline in downtown Durham. Uh, it's a historic dis, uh, designations. Uh, the site is part of the Foster and West Gear Street National Historic District and City Garage Building and Fire Drill Tower are listed as local historic landmarks. Uh, you can see the location of the existing former employee restroom at the southwest corner of City Garage Building. Uh, the building um, is in need of significant environmental re remediation and has um, a lot of mold issues. Uh, this, this small building is approximately 300 square feet, 
constructed with granite ashlar pavers from the form, former Durham streets. Um, and turn to page 11. Here's some photos of the existing structure um, of all the different sides. Um, as you can see the two separate doorways, the block windows, the granite ashlar um, blocks that are used for the construction. It's also partially below grade on one side. So um, you can turn to page 13. Okay. Just, um, we're proposing to relocate the, um, the employee restroom. Uh, the structure is currently located in the approved new developments proposed fire lane and therefore needs to be relocated. You can see the new site plan with the new proposed building, the fire lane alley, this cutting uh, going through the site. Um, and we propose relocating and repurposing the restroom to the northwest corner of the city garage building. Uh, you can go to page 12. So you can see the location there on the northwest uh, corner and page 12 shows the new site there. Um, currently vacant, gently sloping so slopes um, adjacent to the existing city garage building. And it'll also be located on the proposed fire lane alley. Okay. Um, go to page 13. Oh, back there again. So we're showing the location of where we're proposing the um, repurposing the bathroom restroom into an amenity area pavilion and at th that location. Uh, we've been working with Preservation Durham on various options for relocating repurposing the bathroom, some of which was uh, looking at using the granite ashlar block as a screen wall around the transformer. Um, that is really dictated by Duke Energy as far as remain, uh, maintaining clearances and keeping openings toward the alley. Um, and it just it was not a viable solution. And on top of that, Duke would have to have all the um, approvals for that if we did use a screen wall. but it ends up not really screening anything once we put the clearances in and the openings. So um, those requirements kind of negate the intent and purpose of the screen wall and therefore was not a viable option. Another option we looked at with Preservation Durham is relocating the bathroom to the belt line. Um, when the owner developer has had many conversations with the city and parks and recreation. And although the city is receptive to the idea, the uncertainties of the lengthy acceptance process, storage of materials, construction, and schedule made this option um, uncertain. So we let, um, the third option that we've kind of settled on um, is relocating and repurposing the restroom at the amenity pavilion area. And if you can turn to pages 14 and 15, we'll do 14 first. This is kind of the site plan that would happen at that corner of city garage and the uh, corner of the alley fire lane. Um, the proposed outdoor amenity area be located at the Northwest corner um, and to the rear city garage and adjacent to the alley. Repurposing of the restroom will be, and let's turn to page uh, 15 now. You can see different elevations of what this would be proposed um, structure would look like. Repurposing of the restroom into an open air pavilion will be reconstructed with materials found in the original building. It will include a similar building footprint, reuse of the exterior ashlar granite paver blocks and exposed timber joists reminiscent of the restroom ceiling joist. Uh, brick planter seat walls will be reflective of the restroom interior brick walls complementing the adjacent city garage building. The proposed structure will include window openings for visibility and precast concrete paver floors. Built-in wood seating and direct accent lighting and landscaping will create a place for small social interactive gatherings and individual quiet reflection. A plaque located on the wall will tell the story of the historic employee restroom and the development team believes this option, excuse me, has the greatest potential of honoring the history 
of the employee restroom and the site. In the spirit of the site's history of change and adaptation for different uses over time, <coughs> we are seeking to relocate and repurpose the former employee restroom to correspond with the site's evolution into a mixed use residential retail restaurant and entertainment destination. We are committed to preserving the historic integrity of the Granite Ashland restroom as part of a future design of the site, continuing the legacy of reuse. We request approval of the 501 uh, Street Certificate <laughs> of Appropriateness for relocation, repurposing of the former city garage employee restroom, and the, 306, um, the elimination of the 365 day delay for the site's previously approved demolition, COA. Uh, we appreciate the commission's time and consideration and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to commend you on your work in re, uh, restoring and repurposing as many and as much of that restroom as you could. I was very concerned about the, the wording on the plaque, but I and I do understand that you will work with um, Preservation Durham on assuring that that wording tells the the correct story of that uh, of that of that granite uh, and, and and you know of the of the restaurant. So I appreciate that uh, very much. Thank you, Commissioner Calhoun. Do we have uh, any other commissioners who would like to ask any questions of the applicant today? This is Commissioner Goolsby. Um, can you give, me, uh, give us a little bit more understanding about the design of the current pavilion or this pavilion that you're, um, you have here in respect to proportions and the openings of the original structure? You know, are these one for one or is it going to be a smaller version of the restroom? Uh, the building footprint is the same, um, so same scale. <laughs> proportions uh, where the doors are. Currently, we've made a larger opening. There are currently some windows with block glass that are being opened. It probably is a little more open than the existing structure just because we'd like to have eyes, no places for people to hide or just safety reasons, but um, a lot of visibility into and out of the structure. I would just and like I, to add to that. I, that oh, um, Oh, I'm sorry uh, to jump in. I would just like to add to that, though, that that is one of the things that we spent some time discussing with Preservation Durham. Our goal was to make sure that this is a safe and a usable space. Um, if trying to maintain some of the original wall openings and the sizes of those, it felt very closed off. Um, so we went through several different iterations trying to balance the kind of um, uh, I guess the original openings and uh, the two door scenario versus something that we felt would be more usable. And um, this is kind of the result of, of a, a balance between the existing structure and, and what we thought would be uh, safe and usable. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks for clarifying you have to answer my other question. Jonathan. I'd like to uh, follow up on also uh, when Commissioner Calhoun uh, spoke, this is a, uh, I'd like to commend you all on on uh, working together and uh, proving why the 365 day delay is important and that we can uh, shorten it. I hope so that that's what's going to happen in the end of uh, this, as long as uh, really preservation Durham is um, is behind it as well. But working together between the preservation side development and uh, getting to a what looks for it to me as a wonderful solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Dayon. Anybody else? Questions for the applicant today? If not, I will ask if there is anyone else who intends to speak either for or against this application today. Mr. Miller? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Miller and I'm president of Preservation Durham. 
uh, uh, for the commission, I want to say we urge you to uh, approve uh, this new COA application and to lift the 365 day delay. Uh, uh, although uh, uh, Jeff and Cindy have already uh, described to you our process, uh, I want to say how grateful we are uh, that the, this developer uh, gave uh, such a wonderful opportunity to work with them, not only on this pavilion structure, which is the subject of a great deal of concern, but on the overall project. Um, uh, we think that it is much better. With regard to this structure, if you remember uh, when the application first came to you uh, back last fall, uh, the applicant proposed to reuse the the, the uh, granite pavers that are in these buildings here and there throughout the project, but primarily in a horizontal way and in the fire lane. Um, and we thought that uh, the important uh, story this uh, segregated bathroom has to tell would be completely lost if that was what we were going to do. Um, and uh, over the next months, we went back and forth uh, on how best to, to create uh, a building structure that would allow us to tell the story of segregation on this site. Uh, and uh, as, as Cindy and Jeff told you, we looked at several uh, alternatives. I want to note here, just for the record, uh, that uh, uh, Durham architect Brett Horton uh, with Preservation Durham uh, uh, got really interested in this project and proposed that we look at the developer's idea of a pavilion where we preserved the essential scale of the building, but we opened up its spaces to make it an open air pavilion. As you saw, the, the original brick, uh, bathroom building would, would not be very suitable for that purpose. Uh, and so we went back and forth on various designs and we have uh, resolved on this one. Uh, and we're pretty pleased with this. And so we urge you to approve this COA. I wanna conclude, if I may, by saying we all live in, in a statutory and regulatory environment uh, with uh, the COA process that I don't think any of us would have created had it been up to us. The whole business of having the uh, Historic Preservation Commission uh, 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 essentially uh, order a delay and then expect opposing parties to work together. Um, while it is possible, uh, as this project shows, for that to, to actually, that, that 365 days to be used uh, beneficially, it frequently is not. Uh, uh, but here we really did it. And we did it because uh, uh, Jeff and his team were uh, so open to the input that we wanted to give and we're grateful for that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the commission. I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Miller? Seeing no hands raised and hearing none. Um, and given that Mr. Miller spoke in favor of and not in opposition uh, to the application, there's uh, no need for a rebuttal, obviously. And so I think at this stage, I will close the public hearing and invite discussion among my commissioner colleagues. My sense is that we likely all share the same appreciation um, that we've heard from Commissioner Calhoun and Commissioner Dayon and from Mr. Miller. Um, I, I certainly appreciate all the efforts um, undertaken and, and, and duly note what Mr. Miller had to say. There's uh, something inherently adversarial about putting a 365 day delay on a demolition request. Um, that is the tool that we have at our disposal um, and it seems to have uh, yielded something uh, pretty extraordinary in this case. Um, and, and I applaud everybody for your efforts in working together to, to make it happen. If there are no further uh, comments or questions or concerns of any of my fellow commissioners, uh, I would ask uh, Carla for a staff recommendation. 
Carla Rosenberg's uh, planning department, staff would approve recommendation, um, staff would re recommend approval of the application. Um, and I do have a question though, um, as to whether all of the granite papers were used, and if not, if, the, if those were going to be incorporated into the site at all. That's just a curiosity question that I have. Can I answer first? Jeff may want to add. Um, it's uncertain at this time they're going to have to be taken apart from the original bathroom and cleaned. Um, how many of those are viable? We hope most of them will be. But looking at the amount of structure, we may have some blocks left over. But we haven't planned for not knowing how many exactly will be salvageable and be able to be cleaned up and reused. Have not don't have a quantity on that. Thanks. Would somebody like, like to make, make a motion? Uh, please do. Thank you. Uh, the Durham Historic Preservation Commission finds that in the case COA 220002, 501 Washington Street, demolition amendment, the applicant is proposing to amend a previously approved proposal to demolish additions and accessory structures associated with a, land, with a landmark property. Salvaged materials from the employee restroom will be used to construct an open air pavilion at the northwest corner of the primary structure. All other accessory structures and additions will be demolished as previously proposed. The delay of 360, 365 days on the approved demolition per COA 2100068 will be removed. Therefore, the conclusion of law is that the proposed addition and the alterations are consistent with the historic character and qualities of the historic district and are consistent with the historic properties local review criteria, specifically those listed in the staff report and the Durham Historic Preservation Commission <laughs> approves the certificate of appropriateness for case COA 2200002501 Washington Street demolition amendment with the following conditions. One, the improvement shall be substantially consistent with the plans and testimony presented to the commission at this commission hearing and attached to this COA. The improvements may require additional approvement approvals from other city or county departments or state or local agencies. The applicant is responsible for obtaining all required approvals relating to building construction, site work, and work in the right of way. And three, a compliance inspection shall be performed immediately upon completion of the work approved herein. Second, Commissioner Woolley. Thank you, Vice Chair Goolsby. Clerk Holmes, roll call vote, please. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Dan. Approved. Commissioner DeBerry. Approved. Vice Chair Goolsby. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes five to zero. Thanks again, everybody, for all of your hard work on this. Congratulations and, and good luck with the entirety of the project. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate your consideration. Thanks. Fellow commissioners, that is the last case we have on our agenda. Um, we have no items uh, listed under old business, under new business. We have three items, starting with landmark study list proposal, the chicken hut. Carla? Um, so I am just, I'm just communicating with Chris. It looks like uh, the applicants are not here to discuss the project because it's not an actual hearing. Um, I think we could proceed without them. Um, I'll have Chris to confirm that. Um, I'm, we could also take a five minute break and I could just check in with them to see if they could um, check into Zoom. Krista? Okay. Thanks, um, staff. Krista Cougar, City Attorney's Office. I think it's fine to proceed without them if you want. Um, but Carla, if you like, we'll defer to you, Matt, what you want to do. I'm taking a break. 
Well, Chris, please uh, continue to try to um, make contact with the applicant, but I would, uh, given the fact that it's 11.15 in the morning, um, uh, vote in favor of moving forward with um, some at least introductory information from Carla while we're waiting for folks to join. I'll, I'll just resend them an email to see um, and try to get on it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Are you trying to pull up the materials? Sorry, I was just shooting off an email. Um, let me do that. Maybe if you want to wait for the others, I'm just proposing uh, we start with the other CO, with the other uh, minor, or sorry, new business. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Why don't we go ahead and, and uh, check in with Clerk Holmes on the status of uh, minor COAs and then move on to an update on 1106 9th Street and then circle back uh, to the Chicken Hut landmark study list proposal. Yes. I just received um, notice from the applicant. They said, can you give me five minutes? So okay, this great. sounds perfect. Let's be efficient. Miners, the OA report will be emailed to you all by Thursday. Most likely it'll be tomorrow. Thank you very much, Amanda. Update on 1106 9th Street. Carla? Well, actually I'll defer to you. I'll, I'll say a few words. Okay, great. Uh, we, yeah, we've been through a couple of ringers on, on that move, but we now have a permit from the city. Now, what we're holding it up um, all these months, a couple of things. One is uh, the architect we hired to, uh, to draw the flat for uh, 1107. Uh, Cliff Cradle. Yeah, he's. Uh, fairly well known in this area and, uh, and lives in, and works within walking distance of the Mangum property, Mangum Street property. He did not, uh, it was not drawn appropriately. And uh, he, uh, he picked up on that when the commit was the application for commit was, uh, was uh, um, placed and, and they rejected it because they they found that a small piece of the property um, still belonged to the previous uh, owners, and so that everything had to be redrawn, et cetera, and whatnot. So that happened, and uh, uh, but it was determined that uh, what was going to be placed on the property was not overlapping to the area that was in dispute, and so. It, you know, that continued. Of course, in the meantime, uh, we've had issues with the uh, those who signed up to do the move earlier. So uh, I think uh, she now has a new crew that uh, a well experienced group of individuals who are going to, to, uh, to work on that. Um, Canu Bono, who owns you know, the original owner of the house to be moved uh, is hanging in there with us. So he's, he's not tickled to death, but he is uh, uh, willing to participate. He's willing to participate uh, in assuring that this house is moved off, off his property. 
as soon as possible. So I think we are we are in better better shape than we were. Thank you, Commissioner Calhoun. Anyone have any questions for Faye? I, I, I'm, I'm just, unfortunately, I've got like one of those, those minds that's like really good for like retaining information that I need <laughs> when I need it, but kind of flush stuff <laughs> when I, I no longer do. Um, and so I'm, I'm just trying to re remember this application. This wasn't the, the, the property where um, the, the, the structure that was on the site was going to be moved somewhere else. And then it is. Okay. Okay. That helps, thank you. Oh, we can't hear you, Dr. Calhoun. Yeah, the property uh, is uh, 1106 9th Street. And so uh, it was to be moved, lifted off of that site and moved down the street and around the corner and all that sort of thing, all the way over to 1107 Mango Street. Yeah. And so everybody is sticking with them for happy and uh, waiting for the move so we can, you know, get our folding chairs and butter popcorn and wash the shelf, you know, this house going down the street and all that sort of thing. Of course, we found out at some points that that's going to take a bit because, you know, the route that it has to go through has to be approved and the, uh, the house has to be be cut in, in at least two pieces in order to get under some wires. And so all that took uh, a couple of months. And then, you know, we that's when we found out that we uh, submitted it, the permit, you know, the application for the permit and found out that the uh, the land that it was going to, the, the, the flat, the, uh, the drawing was not, it was not correct. So that threw everything into a complete tizzy um, <laughs> and we had to find, uh, trying to get that person to redraw it and go through this and finding him and all that, I mean, really. So that worked. So that went on and on for a while. And finally, we got the direct drawing, uh, the little piece of land that uh, was not going to be a part of this land uh, was still in the in the hands of the former property owner, and the owner died, so it was in the, the estate, and you know, now you have to get another uh, group of lawyers to, to talk to that, those people, but then it was decided, just leave that piece of land off, you know, out of the whole mix, uh, because the house is not going anywhere near that piece of land, you know, that little sliver of land. And so, okay, now we have a permit, I thought, uh, meanwhile, <laughs> Mr. Canoe is still under the 365, 365 day delay for the, you know, if he wanted to de demolish the property. He wanted to demolish it. We wanted to save it and move it. And so that's, uh, that's where we are now, except that, uh, Mr. Uh, Canoe De Bono, who owns the property, owns the house. Is he is working? He's working hard to get that with us to get the, the movers in place and the foundation dug and uh, you know and the house get off off of his property so that he can begin to build his uh, his his new house there on that on that land. So that's about where we are right now. So so so, Dr. Calhoun, what's your best estimate of when we can uh, gather up our lawn chairs and? Get the popcorn ready for the, the parade you know, around the block. I don't know right now. I believe that they are still trying to get approval to lift this wire and come under the, the stoplight here and all that sort of thing. And um, so I, the 10, 10 agencies have to sign off wow. on a move like this, and they don't get the move very often. They don't get this kind of case very often. 
And so everybody's got to go back and read their procedure books before they can sign off and say, yes, you can come under this wire. Yes, you can turn on this. Street. So it's, 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 a, it's been a trip. I had no idea, you know, that it was going to go into all that. We're still working through. Please keep us posted. I want to watch that thing happen. Yeah, we'll keep we will. We will. We, you won't miss the show, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a direct message here from Chris that the applicant is here now for discussion of Chicken Shack. Excuse me, Chicken Hut. My apologies. Good morning, can you hear me? We can. Hello, sorry, so sorry I'm late. <laughs> no, no worries, I'm glad that you're here. Yes, and I'm under my husband's name, it should say Kaya Tapp, but. <laughs> well, Ms. Tapp, it is nice to meet you virtually. Nice to meet you all. And, and Carla, how would you like to proceed here? Yes, yeah, so what, um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen that has your write up, um, but uh, hopefully all of the commissioners have read that right up in advance. And what we'll be discussing today is um, whether uh, we believe based on the evidence so far provided um, or that could potentially be provided, um, the, the um, chicken hut merits a landmark um, designation. And there are criteria, um, which I outlined for you in an email um, that we would uh, be looking at it to meet. So if you have any questions, of course, let me know, but um, this is not a formal hearing, but a courtesy review to give the applicant um, reasonable, you know, a reasonable assessment as to whether it would um, qualify for a, a designation for a, an, a full landmark application to come forward. Um, and Ms. Tapp, if, if you wouldn't mind um, sort of giving us an overview as well um, as to how you maybe came upon um, you know, the idea of obtaining the landmark status and what you hope to accomplish with that. Sure, so a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2019, we worked with the city to um, retrieve some funds to help update our parking lot and just, um, update the building a little bit. And we were told by one of the councilmen, you should look into becoming a landmark since we've been here for so long and the family has done so much for the community. So that was a suggestion back in 2019. And so I finally um, worked to you know, get some more information. And so we decided we've been in the community since 1957, um, well known, supported the community. Um, it started with Claiborne Tap, which is my husband, um, uh, Trey is also known as Trey, Claiborne Tap III, his father founded the business, started it in 1957 in another area, part of Durham. Um, that area was torn down and then moved to where they are currently, uh, the Fayetteville Street location. And when his father got sick, his mother Peggy took over the business, kind of took it to another level. Um, excuse me, so started catering, started serving schools, um, contracts with daycares, charter schools, and so forth. And when she passed in 2018, Trey took it over and continued the legacy business. And again, taking it to the next level with some um, updated interior um, areas. Like I said, updating the parking lot, finding funds to do that, um, and just keeping the area up to so that we can continue to serve Durham, serve the community, um, have a place to come back to, black owned, um, one of the longest standing restaurants here in Durham. And so we do feel like it should be a, uh, it is a staple in the community. And so we feel like it should be a landmark there. Thank you. Um, 
commissioners, do you need me to post what the um, criteria are? Um, and of course, if you have any questions for Ms. Tapp. I think so, so Carla, this would, I just wanted to clarify, this is going on the study list based on That's today's right. discussion. That's right. And today just happens to also be the deadline for the full application for the 2022 year. Carla, to be clear, these are the criteria for designation, not necessarily the criteria for being put on the study list. That's right. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, you're you're going to be assessing whether it reasonably could meet, whether it has the potential garnering yep. further evidence. Okay. Do, do we need a vote on this? I don't know the process for this since it's not a hearing. It It is a vote, um, It, but it's not like a formal hearing vote, yeah. but a vote is would it, be helpful. Yeah, is it essentially, Carla, um, sort of the, 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 the sense of the commission? Um, it, it's not a binding vote. It's, it's more just sort of additional support um, being lent to the applicant uh, to, to move forward with the, with the process. That's right. Okay. Um, because just a reminder that it is a very expensive application um, and there's a lot of um, evidence that needs to be uh, provided. And it's a long process that takes almost a year in full. Carl, if you would help us understand, or, or anybody else for that matter, um, who, who might have knowledge about the process, help us understand um, uh, how these decisions um, are, are ultimately made. Is how much weight is is given to, say, you know, for example, on the one hand, the architectural significance of a structure, uh, versus on the other hand, its its role in the community and sort of its its vitality and in the life of the community. Yeah, um, so the architectural significance is only one of those criteria that's um, given for the other three pertain, well, one of them is for archaeological remains, and the, but the other two are for association with someone um, or um, someone who is, um, you know, very critical in the local history. And then the third one was the events. Um, that it's an event that occurred there. Um, so I, I would argue, I think I wrote to you all that we would be especially focusing on um, the you know, person and, and place being of critical value to the community. That seemed to be the most applicable. Well, and the other thing that I note uh, in terms of the criteria is that um, when you go three sub A, B, C, and D, they are disjunctive, um, not conjunctive. And so it, it doesn't have to be all. Um, exactly. It, it can be one. Right. Okay. Exactly. What about the year? Do we have any historic uh, places uh, from 1957? So we have um, NC Mutual. Um, building was, um, I don't know the exact year off the top of my head, but it was there about um, early 60s, perhaps. Um, we definitely have some, at least one landmark um, from that era. Uh, let me ask, let me ask a couple of questions. One, um, Ms. Tapp, uh, the restaurant existed before 1957, right? The business, he did start a store um, before 1957, but the restaurant, I believe it started in 1957. I can definitely double check, but that's the year 
that we've been going with. So I guess I should have that answer. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking that if it was, if he had a chicken, so, box. you know, a the chicken box. chicken box, right? Mm -hmm. Where was it? Mm -hmm. Do you have a picture of it um, that would document the fact that it was on, was it on Pettigrew Street? Mm -hmm. Where was it? And do you have I, a picture of it from 19... Uh, 40, 1930s. 1947. I think it may be 1947. Yeah. But I, did I give you a picture? Um, I do have a picture. I mean, there's one. Yeah, look at those. I just don't remember if it's in there. In the pictures I gave you. I don't have any pictures. Okay. I'll resend those pictures. And as I had mentioned in the email to um, any sort of documentation memorabilia for events that took place, you know, menus that have been used, um, any sort of documentation um, would be firsthand evidence of the history of mm -hmm. this business. Um, and that would need to be included in the landmark application. And as Dr. Calhoun mentioned as well, like having a map with, um, a marking of where the original location was. We want to build. Um, we want to build the story because part of designation, you know, our interest from the city's side is to really have documentation of what what is it that we're preserving. Why why are we preserving it, and what is the history? Okay. So I think it may just make sense we, for us to get this together and up, go move forward for next year. Would you agree? If, if you have not uh, been able to gather the information, then- I do, yes, I do. I can send that today. I thought I sent that along, so I'm sorry if that wasn't attached. Um, but I do have all the pictures I can send today. So we need more than just pictures. We would need, okay. um, yeah. Um, and Carl, yeah, just to so. kind of reiterate, I think we've said is, is that would be part of the actual landmark that's right. Keith, what we're doing here today is kind of a first step in that to say we, we'd like to see more okay. of that. So okay. is that. Is that correct, Carla? That's right. Um, this is yeah. a first step and we're kind of in a time crunch. I mean, you and right. I had our pre-submittal, I think in uh, February, early February or um, maybe late January. So it was um, very, I think it was early February actually. And so we're on a really tight deadline to get you into the 2022 year. Um, right. I can have a little bit of flexibility regarding, you know, maybe up to two weeks. Um, okay. But um, because ultimately we, we need to be doing the first step in the actual landmark application, which is uh, sending it to SHPO for their initial review, that would need to happen in May. Okay. So, and, so given that, um, this is by uh, Commissioner Goolsby, um, I'm in favor of hearing more about this or seeing this go to the next step. Um, you know what uh sometimes we have a little bit more information here but given um you know what we do have i i love to hear more I, I think it's worth going to the next step with this okay all right carl i'll get you that information asap if i may okay. jump in uh so uh, uh jonathan down um structural integrity there's a lot of innovation interior. I don't know about exterior additions that I saw. Well, I read, um, I didn't, we didn't see. The question, do you think that, uh, and that's to both of you, um, do you think those would impact or not uh, the designation? And did you speak with Tom Miller? Because he's like an encyclopedia <laughs> on, uh, on this issue. Or he would probably want to really help if, if needed. And two, um, go to Open Durham. Um, it's mentioned several times. There's some photographs. There's some background that would be a great starting point for you know further research. I'm also going to include a link to historic aerial imagery from the DOT itself that dates back to the 50s. Um, that could help with some of the urban renewal 
history. It's kind of mind blowing to look back at those old images, but I'll include that in the chat here. And um, all of that is on the Open Durham site too. Um, it has the restaurant, it has the aerials, the urban renewal, all that. Looks like Mr. Miller has raised his hand. Tom, go ahead. So again, my name is Tom Miller. I'm president of Preservation Durham. Um, and uh, I can tell you Preservation Durham would be delighted to help in any way we can. And so when the meeting is over, uh, Ms. Tapp, if you don't mind, I'll send you an, an email to connect and we're available to help you if you can. I wanted to throw in um, the, this place is extremely important to the civil rights and political history of Durham from the late 1970s, right up to uh, fairly recently. It's, um, and it's an incredibly important part of the story. Um, and I participated in that a little bit uh, along the way when wearing another hat. Uh, so uh, I think that this is a great idea and I'm speaking ahead of Preservation Durham, but I am confident that this is an application we can get behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you Mr. Miller, for those thoughts. Well, Carla, what is the... Um, process from this point forward. Do we go ahead and have a, a vote today based on the information that we have available to us today? You could do that. Um, it, it really is just, do you think it has the potential to um, receive landmark status? It's not a binding vote that it does merit it, but does it have potential? Is it worth putting an application forward? Chair Bussard, should we how you open the room? If somebody has a, a motion in mind, uh, by all means, I was trying to scratch something out, but if someone already has something, please. Um, oh, and it doesn't have to be a formal motion. You could just say, does everybody approve of adding this to the study list? Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's keep it just that simple then. Um, uh, does uh, the uh, Durham Historic Preservation Commission um, support adding uh, the Chicken Hut, located at 3019 Fayetteville Street uh, in Durham, uh, to the landmark um, property study list. And I will start off by saying aye. <laughs> I would uh, do a roll, roll call. Let's do a yeah, formal roll, roll call. call. Yep. Yeah. Claire Holmes, one more time. All right. Chair Bouchard. Aye. Commissioner Dayan. Answer would be a little longer. The answer is for sure yes, but from what I'm hearing, there's a lot more uh, substance that could be added, and I urge the applicant to add that in. Gotcha. Uh, Commissioner DeBerry? Yes. Vice Chair Goolsby? Yes. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes, I'd like to see more information on the history of the chicken hut back to uh, uh, urban renewal. So I put it on the study list. Yes. All right, looks like it was a consensus of five to zero consensus. Yes. This is Commissioner Hamilton. I don't have to recuse myself, but I also say aye, so it'll be six to zero. Okay, six, okay, so yes, you say aye as well, Commissioner Hamilton? Okay, six Sorry. to zero. Sorry about that. Oh, Ms. Tapp, uh, good luck to you and, and to your husband in moving the process forward. We'll be uh, watching with great interest. Okay, thank you. And I will um, get this information ASAP. To, Car to Carla, right? Carla, send it to yes. you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And if 
if you'd like to have another meeting to talk through things, um, and you know, I can also, you know, probably Mr. Miller could help as well in um, connecting you with an architectural historian um, who could help assemble things as well. Okay. If that's something that's of interest to you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Come down for lunch. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks again. Yes. Okay, bye-bye. I believe we have reached the uh, end of our agenda. We went a little bit longer today than I had imagined, um, but I think we did some really good work today, y'all, um, with, with our cases and with approving that um, landmark um, study. So I um, want to thank everybody for hanging in. Uh, does anyone have anything else that they want to share um, other than best wishes to Jonathan? I'll miss you, Jonathan. We it was nice will. working with you. It was great working with you, and I'll miss you all, too. Uh, I didn't mention every single one of you, but it's uh, it was a great pleasure. Um, I respect you, Amanda Grace. I, I said that to the uh, commission as well, but no. You, Amanda, Grace, uh, that I didn't, uh, and Krista, of course. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And if your circumstances change, Jonathan, let us know. I, I will give you yes. a call. <laughs> Best wishes, Jonathan. Everyone, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye, Take everyone. Care.